So everyone should have gotten that little notification. All right, do we have everyone? I think we probably do at this point. Um, so my name is Trisha Ponto. I'm with the City of Livermore's Planning Division. I'm gonna be your facilitator. Um, and I think we're um, gonna share, Allison, you're gonna share your screen for the note section. Um, so we're gonna go through those questions that were shown on the slide previously in the presentation, um, but we're gonna start with some introductions if people wanna go around and just say your name and maybe where you work or what part of town you live in, um, and then we'll get going on the discussion questions. So I'm actually, I also live in Livermore too. Um, I live over near Livermore High and I grew up in Livermore. Um, so I have been here a long time. All right, I'm gonna kick it over. Maybe Allison can just introduce yourself really quickly too. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, can you all see my screen share? Is it, um, you can see the Google doc with the notes? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, my name is Allison. I am with PlaceWorks. I live right over the hill in El Cerrito. Um, and uh, I will also be attending a work or the a community event, the library on Saturday, which I really look forward to. Um, and it's great to meet you all. It's going to be a fun discussion tonight. All right, who wants to go next? I'll go next. Uh, Hi, I'm Paula DeLiso, and um, I have uh, owned property in, in Livermore since the early 80s, and I've seen, um, you know, a lot of them. Yeah, me too. Okay. Yeah, that okay. just, that just okay. got kicked out. Oh, you don't know quick. why that happened, but we are going to put you back in your small groups. I'm sorry about Please that. Go. That is my mistake. Hold with us just a sec. Sorry about the interruption. Okay. I am opening once again. Hey. Hi again. Hi. Okay. Hey. So, um, yeah, so back, so I'm Paula DeLiso. I've uh, owned property in Livermore since the early 80s, seen a lot of change. Um, I work for an architecture firm um, and also have a, uh, a real estate license. So I kind of revolved around this kind of activity um, in multiple different directions. Great. All right, I'm just gonna move down on my, what I see here. John, you wanna go next? Hey, um, I'm from Livermore, live in beautiful Livermore. It's an awesome town. I got, I've lived here since 1980 and I got to see it grow from a, a cow town, basically to what it, a vibrant community, what it is today. today. Um, I think the Livermore planning for downtown is awesome and they need to be commended, basically. Um, I have certain visions of what I look forward to in the things that cater to my own interests, but I realize other people's interests are important too, but I'm all about uh, more hiking parks and there's some excellent opportunities out there for that to take advantage of that people need to know about. So anyways, that's it. Great, thanks. Um, Alan, you wanna go next? Yes, Alan Burnham. I, um, I've been here since uh, 77. I've also seen a lot of these changes, uh, um, you know, from just a, a few restaurants to a vibrant downtown, uh, a, a fine arts uh, theater. And, and I'm si excited about all those positive changes. Of course, it comes with the downside of a lot more traffic. Um, that's uh, usually what happens when you <laughs> have uh, growth is more traffic. And so so I think the, the important thing for the general plan is to really balance um, how to uh, get the good things we want and minimize the, the uh, undesirable side effects. And, um, you know, and I, uh, and we're going to have um, a lot more housing that's going to be mandated for us. And so how are we going to uh, uh, put all that um, housing within the uh, city boundaries and still keep our, uh, Small town friendly character. Right. Allison, I do not own an architecture firm. I work for an architecture firm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I would love to own it, but I don't. Um, and also, I have owned property here since the early 80s. Um, we were a uh, landlord, um, but we have moved into the property. We've here, been here about eight years. We've lived here for eight years, but have owned property since the early 80s. There we go. 
Yeah. And you know, I'm taking super detailed notes. I think I'm just going to kind of try to be more, more high level here with the introductions. I think I am <laughs> going for the minutes approach, but maybe might go ahead and try the summary approach. <laughs> All right, Allie, you want to go next? Hi, everyone. My name is Allie Felker. Um, my husband and I were pretty involved with um, some of the downtown discussions when that plan was going down. And so that just really sparked um, an interest for me in just the future of our city. And so I'm here just as a person who's interested. I don't have any great credentials, but um, we own our home in Livermore and um, we've been here for a couple of years. And I work in Livermore as well. I'm a hairdresser. Great, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, Loretta. Hi, my name is Loretta Caskey. I have lived in Livermore since 1988, um, owned property since uh, the early 90s. Um, am very fortunate, spoiled, blessed to live in the old South Side. Um, I have been one of the people who have commuted down to the peninsula. So for over probably 28 years, uh, sometimes even taking uh, the ACE train. Uh, so I'm a big uh, fan of that kind of transport for people to get people out of their cars. Um, and I currently am working at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and I have long been associated with the Livermore Heritage Guild. And I'm just putting in a plug that history and heritage are part of the cultural arts. Great, thank you. Um, and then I know, Paul, if you wanna say, say hi to everyone, this is Paul Spencer, Community Development Director with the City of Livermore. Hi everyone, I am uh, gonna be bouncing between a few rooms. I'm really excited about this general plan update process and I appreciate the uh, participation today. So thanks. All right. And we're, if we can do this now, or we can do this at the end, but we're going to need to choose one person kind of be our spokesperson. So if anyone feels like they're, you know, willing to volunteer for that now, just to summarize to the larger group, what we talked about, um, willing to take volunteers for that now, otherwise we can wait towards the end. I make a, a slight comment on what you stated to me. It says, Future, uh, future hiking areas, it needs to say future. It says, great, under John Cunder, it says great hiking opportunities. Okay, uh, I say, got it. It should say future great hiking okay. opportunities. Excellent. And I think we will also have a chance to discuss this, you know, these are the introductions and we'll, we'll definitely have a chance to, but I definitely wanna make sure I get this all, this all right. Is that, does that look better? John, did we get that right? Does that does that look any? Um, I think I hope to made that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank All you right. so much. Anyone feeling strongly about wanting to be our spokesperson? Any takers? Well, I I will do it if nobody else wants to. Okay. We'll we'll select you for now. And then if anyone feels strongly about it later, we can discuss it. But okay. Um, so I think we can move on to the first discussion question. Okay, so, you know, based on that last poll that we just did, those, the polling before we broke into our small, small groups. Um, so what did you see that resonated with you from the large group poll about what you like about and imagine for Livermore? And if there are any um, other words or ideas you wanna throw out into that topic before we move on to other discussion questions. What do, you, what do you like about Livermore and what do you imagine for Livermore's future? Open space, vibrant downtown, a need for housing to stimulate um, the retail and restaurant economic vitality. And the housing should be downtown, need more housing downtown.
in the economic vitality. And then I think diversity and inclusion were both words that were good to include. Okay. You could add a welcoming uh, community to that. You think that should go in the same bullet? Yes. I think eventually when we um, write these notes, we sort of group things by theme. So right now I might just kind of get down your comments by, by bullet point and, um, and we can see if we need to do some, some reorganization. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. uh, may I suggest uh, also for the downtown that it's a place people want to be and it's more than just drinking. It's a place where we could have a science center along with the arts and um, historic, um, maybe museums. You don't have to put maybe, go ahead and say it. <laughs> um, like a science center. And um, don't forget the theaters, both uh, movie and performing arts. Mm -hmm. You gotta have things to do if you want your city to be vibrant. We need probably different types of shopping. Um, it goes on with that vibrant downtown and not just being, I'm okay, I'm okay with the party scene, but there should really be more. I totally agree. And I think with that, it needs to be easy to start small businesses in Livermore. Um, so making sure that our small business owners and family owned businesses are able to, sorry, I have a newborn. <laughs> um, yeah. I wanna hear from him too. <laughs> I heard people talk about um, small town, <clears throat> maintain a small town feel and have hiking and rec recreational um, activities accessible. Yeah. So, so, so as the founder of the Sciences Center, I, I, I certainly uh, um, agree with uh, Loretta's comments. I think the other thing that, uh, is that people want an urban boundary so that they feel like they are connected to a rural um, environment. It's not a matter of, com uh, it's not considering, it's, it's maintaining. <laughs> we have a, love, a lot of lovely parks, but they do kind of need to be refreshed. <clears throat> And I think some of this may tie into our next question too. I don't know if we want to move on to that one, um, but that one speaks to you know what is you know, what is your vision for Livermore in twenty forty five? Oh, was that question too? Do we want to move on from this? Yeah, I mean, I think if there's anything that um, anyone wants to add about what they like about Livermore now, and then maybe if any anything that pertains to Livermore, your vision for Livermore in 2045, we can move that to the next section. I think it's fine to be to, you know, be a little redundant and have the same themes in both places. I just want to. Oh, I see. Yes. Um, yeah, we can do a little reshuffling here. It but it sounds like, like you know, things like maintain an urban gro growth boundary, it sounds like that's something people, you know, may like about Livermore now that we have that urban growth boundary. Yeah, maintain, maintain. You can tell us apart from our cities to the east.
Could you may elaborate? You mean just unique in character? Sure. Okay. And that we don't have um, the sprawl that appears to be consistent with um, maybe another city close by. Like Dublin. Yeah. Starts with a D. Dublin. Yeah, I, I think the other aspect of it, I think we have more uh, more heritage. Um, the Lord, I mentioned that in the Heritage Guild. I, I've written a book about uh, uh, the oil exploration around Livermore going, dating back 150 years. And there's just all sorts of wonderful things. And by the way, Allison, we are, one of our daughters and family live in uh, El Cerrito, and I like Livermore better. <laughs> <laughs> when we go to talk to the third grade, third grade is when you learn about your city's um, history, um, we find that it resonates with kids that their place um, does, the place that they live does have a story. And you definitely get that when they come back, even like in fifth grade, and they see the history mobile and they bring their parents and they're talking about, you know, the totem pole and they're talking about other things that um, they have learned about their city. So again, a place that we can um, uh, we can share our heritage with um, our community. This is Paul. I'm going to step out to another group, but I really appreciate you letting me listen in. Uh, lots of great comments here, so thank you. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, maybe we can move on to the next section. I'm trying to balance getting everything down and, you know, making sure everything's organized. So, uh, you know, maybe we can, um, if we have some time, we can go through everything uh, once we've gone through taking a first pass and see if um, there are any bullets from one section that could be moved to another. Or, or duplicated even, that's, I think that's also okay. You know, some yeah. things are both things we like and want to uh, keep and, you know, things that are also a vision for the future. So I yeah. think, does that sound okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so then, yeah, let's, uh, Trisha, if that's okay, let's move yeah. on to the second I mean, question. Yeah, so what is your vision for Livermore in 2045? I have one. Um, to evolve in uh, such a way to respect the quality and integrity of existing neighborhoods. Um, I think it would be good to create more inclusion between most of Livermore and North Livermore. So like the Vasco Springtown area. And maybe that would be um, adding a downtown area in like the Vasco Springtown North area. So whatever zoning would have to happen for that would obviously. Is my spelling project spelling this right? <laughs> uh, Springtown. Springtown. Oh, thank you. It's kind of like what they envisioned uh, for the uh, BART community. I think there's still a general plan out there for that. The uh, Isabel. Right, yeah, that would be the, the Isabel neighborhood specific plan area. Yeah, more of a complete neighborhood. I didn't mean to put words in your mouth, out, um, Alan. Oh, no worries. <laughs> There's one thing that I uh, I would um, I'm not sure exactly how to solve it, but um, you know there used to be a lot of shopping vibrant shopping centers around. Uh, there was the uh, the one across from City Hall uh, that had a Knob Hill for a while. There's the Big T. There was a Rincon. 
a lot of those are dying. And so we need, and, and so um, you have to drive further for shopping. And, and so how are we going to um, enable people to um, do a lot of their living by, by walking uh, and, and, um, and, and not be strictly a car oriented uh, town? Certainly we, we have to drive, but uh, that would be, I guess my vision is figuring out a way of, of being able to um, create a, uh, a walkable, uh, town over larger distances. Helen, what you're talking about with these shopping centers and such that are dying, you know, that that's just a reality of how retail is evolving. And the only way to, you know, work on that is to create a live work play environment. And that's yeah. what's happening with a lot of the um, of the malls they are being repositioned and they're adding housing and they're adding entertainment and um, experiential types of activities. So, and, and that's what really, that's what downtown needs. It needs to be activated. Yeah, no, I understand that. And the same would be true, I think in the, the old Knob Hill area, that that is considered to be uh, uh, essentially commercial on the first floor and then residential above right. that. So it, it's a question of not having it only downtown, but having pockets of, of this mixed residential retail in different it, parts. It, it, it's still pretty it's tough though. That's still pretty tough. What we see in San Francisco is that it's required to have um, ground floor retail in these mixed use developments and there's vacancies everywhere. And that even pre-COVID, they're just difficult to, to fill. I, I think we're looking at a model where we have, a, have sustainable neighborhoods. So neighborhoods that have, um, you know, the, uh, and truly uh, Livermore, I think is very, has been very good at this. Um, the model where you do have housing, but you do also have retail next door to it. I believe, I don't know what, prog how, what, what is stalling the project at Rincon, but on the north side in Rincon, you have the ability to have um, a little bit of, you know, kind of like a neighborhood um, restaurant pub, with a little bit of shopping, primarily housing, but if you look at it, you're near a library and you're near a community center with a big playground. So um, that kind of stuff um, continues, I think, to be echoed. I, I would like not to see that removed from um, our existing uh, development um, codes and I guess building blocks. I don't know if this is the right time to ask this, but I think we would need to make sure that the zoning requirements can match up with the, our vision. So if the vision is for all of these things to happen, especially with like the Knob Hill area, like are, is the zoning actually matching up for what the vision is? Zoning will always follow um, developers' money. I don't think it's going to be a problem for the for the zoning to uh, create a project that the community believes in. Um, but I wholeheartedly understand what Ali wants to say. I got about a. Three, three or four things to come up with if, if, if you want me to say it yet. I don't know. Yeah. Go for it. Okay, so technology is advancing forward and we got small electric mobility devices that are going to get very popular in the future. For example, the e-bicycle, mm. e scooter, these things are going to get, these things are going to get really popular. We need our, we need our bicycle trails and our roadways to be able to manage <clears throat> people on vehicles that do not have an exterior surrounding them around them like a bicycle that has a motor basically and so i i think the bicycle trail network needs to be modified and updated to accommodate that does that help 
Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I like your uh, I like your ideas about infrastructure, and I would riff on them that we also may be getting into um, the area in 2045, where um, uh, we already see that uh, Amazon and um, any other uh, fine uh, commercial warehouse entity can bring me anything I wish, mm -hmm. and the um, I guess the vision in the future that there might be these um, uh, um, atomic, I'm sorry, uh, autonomous um, delivery units. And in the same way that you might need better bicycle paths to protect people, you might need um, certain kind of uh, lanes, um, for lack of a better word, uh, for those kind of vehicles too. Uh, but I, I think it's, I think, uh, you know, if you can group it under some kind of uh, improved infrastructure for um, people and delivery and um, simply passage of, of goods. Yeah, I, I think the key here that a, a couple of you mentioned is, is that we need to imagine how technology will be changing in the next 20 years and making sure that we have our infrastructure and our um, zoning uh, that can be compatible not only with what will happen, but actually um, uh, accentuate the positive aspects of that technology development. <clears throat> I think also if we can allow for some creative businesses to open up like i there was a market in santa barbara that i visited where there was a restaurant and a brewery and like a little marketplace where vendors had different booths um so things like that being allowed to be created or an area where food trucks can come you know every thursday through sunday um and we can have like an outdoor dining you know Food court isn't really the word I would use, but yeah, like some type it's of an a, outdoor, yeah. Like a, a food, like a food hall and yeah. a food truck. So, so, um, so, so Livermore's version of um, the ferry building in San Francisco, right. or yeah, the uh, Friday nights in Oakland around the museum where they do have the bands and they do have all the food trucks. Yeah, exactly. But almost like a space where, because I know food trucks do come in and do the um, like the weekend farmers market, but something where it's like a designated space for it almost, where people can go and hang out, um, I think would be really cool. Castro Valley just put in a miniature food hall down there on uh, Castro Valley Boulevard. Can I add another one? Completely different idea? Of course. Um, so in the parks potential for the future, Zone 7 has purchased 5,000 acres surrounding Lake Del Val, and they are asking for LARPD or the East Bay Regional Park District to manage future and new trail networks mm -hmm. on land that they already purchased, 5,000 acres around Lake Del Val. Mm -hmm. They also now manage lake a of <clears throat> chain of lakes and that'll be available in two years for uh zone seven to allow east bay regional parks or livermore recreation departments to manage the trails there also is that i can restate state that if you want uh yeah i'm trying to um sort of interpret that as a vision for livermore um okay. Future nature, future outdoor nature park. Yeah. So, okay. so I, I think the key here is maybe connectivity to these exterior because it's it's sort of outside the city's general plan. LARPD. Well, LARPD, LARPD is not the city of Livermore. It's just, uh, but I mean the point. The, the point is that um, say if you want to go to uh, Shadow Cliffs or you want to go to uh, 
Sycamore Grove or any of these other places, you really want to make sure that it's possible to get there with, without uh, having to jump into a car. You can, you can actually uh, maybe take one of the e-bikes out there and enjoy, enjoy these trails uh, without having to uh, drive. Technically, that already exists. Um, Lake A of um, Chain of Lakes is in the south side of Livermore. One can walk to that. One can do a connection to Sycamore Grove Park. Sycamore Grove Park already connects to Lake Del Val. So that network already sort of exists. Mm. So how would we like to see that change? Okay. Maybe we could just hop up, Allison, back up to number one and note that as like something that's here today. Um, that it sounds like people like. I'm not, I, I think the need for connections to nature is probably was in the right place in the vision. And then this additional detail about um, Lake A and Chain of Lakes is, is more about something that's here already today, if I understood correctly. It's, it's available. It, it requires a park management district to take it over. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Zone 7 has no interest in turning it into a park. They're, they manage water. Basically. It sounds like part of what you're bringing up, John, is also just um, the importance of collaboration and, and clear communication with other separate agencies like LARPD and Zone 7 that, that have more direct control over some of these facilities. One, one thing that is not mentioned here is Valley Link or ACE or the other things uh, which uh, can get people off the freeways uh, in order to uh, minimize cut through traffic. Um, and this, this is not a city of Livermore uh, responsibility per se, but it certainly is involved in the, uh, has people involved in those agencies as liaisons to make sure, uh, So, you know, it goes back to the issue of partnership issue with other agencies. Everyone, I'm going to have to step out. I got to got to put the kids to bed, but thanks. Thanks. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and, I, and I can say for personal experience, having commuted to the uh, peninsula for five years, there is no viable public transportation route to the peninsula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have another section later for uh, issues. So maybe if we want to move on to the next question and we can add some of that stuff into. Add one to this old list that I didn't get to yet. Okay. Yeah. N3 Ranch. It's called N3 Ranch. Like that? Yes. Um, California has already allocated $20 million to it. Uh, Alameda County has already allocated so many millions to it, so is a fund. I would like to see Livermore contribute to this. N3 Ranch is the waterway that feeds Lake Del Val. It is 50,000 acres, and it needs about $10, $10 million more to make it happen, basically. Could you spell the name of the lake? Lake Del Val? D E L V E V A L space space V A L L E. Excellent, thank you. Five thousand acres, fifty thousand acres. Um, future park potential, with state and county already invested in it. Uh, okay, let's see. I, I don't know. Do we have somebody from the city uh, or PlaceWorks who can answer the question about about the city of Livermore uh, contributing to um, what will be more of like a state park or county park? I mean, I I, I, I quite frankly don't know. But that's something that's something the city does. Yeah, we have done some partnering with um, LERPD and um, East Bay Regional Park District to 
conserve land for open space um, and regional parks that are outside of the city. Um, so it's not, it doesn't necessarily need to be within the city limits for the city to help, you know, conserve and protect open space and, and park land. So it's definitely something we can talk about. Should we? Um, yeah, let's move on, on move just on. so we can make sure we get to each of them. And if there, we have some time left, we can you know circle back through and see if there's anything we want to add. Um, so this next one is about what principles do you think are important for the city to consider as they update the general plan and make decisions on Livermore's future? And so um, these guiding principles can be things like equity, sustainability, innovation. Um, so what kind of these guiding principles should uh, we be thinking about as we develop this plan? Sustainability seems um, like a, a future kind of word. Um, obviously, uh, equity. And um, so when it comes to sustainability, are you thinking um, all types, you know, environmental, um, economical? Um, are there any particular type of sustainability you had in mind or all of the above? Um, Livermore has, I, from the finance standpoint, um, Livermore has long had a principle in place that uh, we are fiscally responsible uh, type of a city. Um, so I can't imagine that being removed from our core um, uh, values, if you will, or principle. in this case, we're talking principles, but I think you could take the word principles and put values in there as well. Yeah. But I mean, it's it, it, it seems that for the future, we do need to kind of consider our participation in the environment. And also, if we build housing, do we have the water to sustain it? Sewer to sustain it. The infrastructure as far as roads, police. Um, Loretta, could you similar could similarly say a, a little bit more about um, what what equity means to you, or how you see it fitting into the general plan process? Oh um, well, equity to me um, is more than one voice at the table. Great. Another aspect of equity that I was thinking of is an environment where everyone can thrive, where everyone can find a way of, of uh, pursuing their dream. Um, now, it, that's not just the city's um, responsibility. Of course, the school districts, the parks, every, all, all the agencies need to be there, but certainly to the extent that the city can uh, take into account in its policies the fact that people have different um, strengths and desires and and, and, and realize that uh, not everybody's the same. <clears throat> so I'm kind of hearing both a respect for differences and also a way of kind of responding to and fostering people's unique individual strengths. Yes. And, you know, and that also, I think um, there was a, a statement earlier about a bedroom community, you know, seeking um, a work housing balance um, is also a, a general principle. 
and and mm -hmm. seeing you know and looking for kinds of uh, businesses and industry and whatever that that can uh, allow a, a diverse set of diverse population to find their niche. Oh, Livermore's housing, um, uh, um, balance, um, isn't as bad as some other places. So I think just continuing it is probably a good idea. Um, we've done, I think a lot to grow spaces at the outer edges of Livermore for warehousing, whether it's Tesla's battery, um, group or whether it's, um, Gillig, the bus machine. So you have uh, in the world, you will always have different le um, economic levels. I don't think we're to the point yet in Livermore where we you know, have to mandate a um, sustainable, you know, uh, like they did in Stockton. Um, I'm sorry, it's the end of my day, I'm so You're thinking tired. of a universal basic income? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether, um, we've always been a bedroom community. I, I'm waiting to see what the new census data says, but we've always been a group that's been, um, you know, obviously like 85% of us drive out for jobs. That's got to change, um, I think, to basically handle the environmental impacts of things. But finding the right balances of companies uh, to support the, the economy that will become in the future for Livermore. I don't know if I have the answers for that yet. I'm still looking at it. I mean, we, we talk a lot about the North side. We talk a lot about um, how many kids um, in the school systems really need the free lunch programs. Um, in, a few, in, the, in a future, I want to still, be, I, I don't want anybody in Livermore to, you know, especially kids to be hungry. So continuing that kind of a thing, but we got to figure out a way to help everybody. <laughs> I don't know if that's equity, um, the jobs housing thing, you know, how do we get more people to uh, be able to live in our community and work here? Again, our, our balance isn't as bad as some other places, um, on the, especially in the peninsula. Uh, I don't know, Alan, help me out here. What do you think about? Well, I, I certainly agree with what you're saying. Um, when, when we came, um, you were either a cowboy or a labby uh, or a commuter. <laughs> and the opportunities uh, are a lot uh, uh, more diverse now. And, and I think that's good. Um, I, get, I guess the question in my mind is how, how is our economy going to evolve in the next 20 years? What kind of jobs will exist? Will we, be, will we have um, zoning which will enable us to dynamically adjust um, and and because because I don't think any of us are really capable of predicting the future twenty five years from now with any accuracy. I got a new subject. Uh, Gavin Newsom just signed a bill that allows basically for granny flats on your own property. What this could also mean is a, a someone that owns a house could buy a $50,000 portable house and put it on their property and rent it out. And what I'd like to see is the technology, whenever a house is sold or new houses, they accommodate the needs for that particular extra building. It'll, it'll take more amperage load for, uh, for power. And also you can, you can also pre plummet the house exterior to where, where you think a granny flat will occur. An example of this is Elon Musk lives in a $50,000 portable trailer right now in Texas. This technology is gonna get a lot more popular and 
is also technology that could be used for homeless shelters too, uh, for, on public land. So could you clarify, um, what I think what you're referring to is, is, is having zoning that, um, that has uh, utility requirements that can accommodate the... Yes. So Gavin Newsom's already made it, forced a zoning that allows for these type of structures to be built. But same token, the city can, just like the city mandated that uh, we have to go to 200 amp usage, uh, that's in the new uh, energy plan for the Livermore, basically, that some people don't like. But you're going to, whenever you sell a house, you're going to have to up it to 200 amps. That's already happening. But you No, can that's actually not happening. Okay, thank you. But it's okay. It's being discussed, though, right? No, no point of sale stuff is being discussed. For uh, if you're referring to the Lumber Climate Action Plan, that isn't in the plan. Okay, so okay, there's talk of it then. I thought not I at the city level, no. Okay, but but, but Trish can uh, Tr uh, Trisha, you can confirm the fact that Livermore already has. We don't call them granny flats. We call them auxiliary dwelling units is that right adus yeah accessory dwelling units yeah accessory sorry um so the real concern i think is uh taking that one flat and basically being able to um uh if you have the land instead of one um adu uh build four and then the experiment becomes in uh, things like micro housing, as I think what somebody was mentioning that that um, project. So um, somebody like me who lives on the south side, and I, you know, if I live in 150 deep by 50 wide lot, I got plenty of space in my world to build four tiny units. Um, but then again, it's how do you sustain it? So going back to that sustainability or what you develop. Um, yeah, but I think, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it sounds like, especially when it comes to infrastructure and services and making sure that we're ha we, ha we have adequate infrastructure and services to serve all these units. Yeah, so even though I'd, I might be land-wise be able to do it, the South Side may have an issue. I'm not saying we do, but maybe I am. Uh, we have an issue with a shallow sewers so if I have a land, if I have the land to build four more small houses on my property, I am now dumping five uh, sewer um, outlets into a space that in the past only had one. Again, your point about increasing the um, electricity. Again, what we have right in the old South Side, again, it's neighborhood, it's probably gonna be more neighborhood specific. Um, we do not have buried, um, uh, uh, utilities, so uh, meaning electric. So uh, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's easier for me to access um, electricity and cable um, telephone uh, that way. Who knows? If I remember reading about um, Gavin's plan is that, yes, you can you know, put up to four units per parcel, but there is a um, a land size component to it. So it's just not. As there should be. Not, <laughs> right, exactly. So I'm just pointing that out, that's all. And Paula, that's why I clarified if I have 150 by 50, I might be able to put that. Right, so right. So I'm glad you're paying attention to Paul. <laughs> I, I would just wanna say, I'm gonna leave you guys to it in just a second, but I think when this, when we started kind of talking about this, I, I think I also heard something that might translate into a principle about um, maybe you call it flexibility or maybe you call it innovation or something just to acknowledge a point that I think John was raising that, you know, even right now today, we have new types of homes, new types of housing construction um, that are going to come online that may become more popular and what opportunities might those um, open up and could it be a principle for the city to you know, adapt to those kinds of changes um, over time and be willing to incorporate those changes or, or not. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I, that, that was a piece of it. Well, I think what Loretta uh, was talking about was the underlying infrastructure and, oh, and yes. I, 
the city just did a whole bunch of uh, sewer replacement there around, uh, you know, Livermore High and, and towards uh, Fifth Avenue School. And, um, and, and I guess I'm sure people in the city staff are thinking about this stuff. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, it, making sure that the infrastructure is uh, looking towards the future is very important. Mm -hmm. But I think I was saying something that I also heard earlier about how we kind of don't really know what's going to happen in certain things like technology or the marketplace on, you know, retail. And, you know, does, I think Ali was speaking to this earlier too, before she left about making sure our zoning matches what we want to do. But when that changes so quickly or it's so unpredictable and it, it takes a long time for us to change zoning, um how do we how do we work in some flexibility and so we can be adaptable to um you know kind of an uncertain future in areas like you know retail markets or um technology and things like that so i think that that was something i definitely picked up on too throughout this discussion yeah I think all of this growth, again, needs to really be balanced with maintaining uh, integrity of, and character of neighborhoods. Um, all right, group two, you guys are doing really great. And um, I'm going to hop around and see one or two more groups before we close, but we are moving towards wrapping up here. So you yes, might want to spend a couple of minutes on the on the last question and then um, get ready to wrap up and present back to everybody. Yep. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. OK, okay. last one. Uh, <laughs> this is the fun one. I think there will also be a lot of things from the other sections that we can kind of uh, copy or repeat here. Right. Yeah, so basically what key issues should the general plan address? So I got a very small one. I wouldn't call it key, but uh, I, I think it's uh, disgusting that there is not a marijuana dispensary in Livermore area. Um, that is something that is not that harmful necessarily. And why does Livermore not have a marijuana dispensary? basically, if that makes sense. How to word that, I don't know. I think it's timing just hasn't come. I mean, I'm sure staff can tell you about the wringing of hands we had when we went from, you know, one tattoo parlor to many. Yeah. So, so I, oh, are you done with that one? Well, I was going to say uh, various cities already have these type of things and they are they probably do limit them already. Um, and there's there's state laws that make it difficult for mom and pop organizations to open stuff like these things. Go ahead, Alan, you want to say something? Well, I, well, I'll just add that I I worked for several years in a small town in Colorado, Rifle, Colorado, population 7000 had, I think, six of marijuana dispensaries but <laughs> uh what i was really going to bring up is that a lot of the issues we talked about earlier had to do with uh either bay area or state mandates in terms of housing and and in the and the um the affordability range of the housing and so the general plan is going to have to address how it will meet all these mandates and still be able to maintain all the things about livermore that we that we like and there's going to be some conflicts and so how 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 are those conflicts going to be resolved mm -hmm. i believe state requires cities to have um, a housing growth at an x amount of rate per year is that correct whether it's like two percent or something like that is that is there existing state law that does that for there's existing state law that mandates that um, cities and counties must zone for a certain amount of housing units over an eight year period. Mm. But that does not mean that those housing units need to get built over that eight year period. It just means that cities and counties need to ensure that there's enough space to build them if the market if if opportunities come along. 
that makes sense. That, that is that, yeah, that's the RENA process. Yeah. However, there's also organizations like CARLA that are suing cities who come up with reasons why not to build affordable housing and things like that. So um, the reality is it, there's, there's going to have to be development. I mean, these things are going to have to be built. So we're, we're in a constant battle. Do we, are, do we want to be a slow growth city or not be a slow growth city? Um, typically, homeowners want slow growth. Mm -hmm. Homeowners don't. I think I think we want smart growth, and we, I, we want to put growth where we know we can um, basically handle the infrastructure and handle all the utilities that we need, not uh, do any kind of leapfrog um, development. Uh, Livermore has long held that um, as a, a principle. Um, but you're right; it's a it's a it's a it's a huge balancing act. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the challenges, of course, uh, is is with the urban growth boundary, which I think by far the uh, the large majority support um, means that there's a smaller amount of land on the inside to for uh, for building the housing. Uh, and and uh, one of the staff here could maybe correct me in terms of what the exact allocations are from the uh, the Bay Area um, group that mandates housing, but it's 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 thousands of units. Yeah, for our next housing cycle, um, which will start at the beginning of 2023 and run for seven, Steve, is it seven or eight years? Um, but basically for the next seven or eight year cycle, we're gonna have, I think around 4,500 units that we're supposed to be able to accommodate within the city. I group two, I am back just to make sure you guys are wrapping up. We're going to be closing the breakout rooms in just a minute or two. So make sure you have a spokesperson. You're going to have your notes on screen. You don't have to remember everything, but it would be great to have someone who's willing to summarize what your group talked about. Alan, are you still willing to do that for us? Yeah, I'm still willing, but of course, as people have noted, that we've we've mixed uh, the answers uh, kind of across issues here, and I'm not quite sure. That's yeah, we, we, we wanna... understand. That's very normal. Don't worry about that. <laughs> well, if we had a, a a little bit of time. Sorry for that cut off, Asa, but um, thank you. All right, Tarina, it looks like our rooms are closed now and we're back together in the large group. All right, thank you so much, everybody. I know for some of you that might have been an abrupt end to the conversation, so I apologize. That's one of the, that's one of the downsides of the virtual meeting format. But um, thank you all so much for your discussions. Um, right now, we're going to hear each one of your groups um, report back on what you um, talked about. So we're just going to go down the list. We have um, five groups. So if you could each report back in about uh, two minutes, obviously, that's not enough time to reiterate everything that you said. but. Um, hit the high points for us, especially if there was anything that your group really strongly agreed on or um, anything that was um, a difference of opinion where you want to tell us both sides of the story. So we're going to start um, with group one and we'll just uh, go in order. So um, the group one spokesperson can uh, unmute themselves and um, then you can uh, go ahead and give us your report back. So group one, who should we be uh, Excuse me, about? Asa. Okay, fantastic. Take it away, Asa, thank you. Yeah, so under two minutes, I don't know if we have time to go through every single question that we did because it was quite a, a lot of discussion that we had. And it was a lot of fun uh, having this talk, but it really, we, we can break it down. It's really, uh, our, our group was really uh, focused around um, maintaining our community character, but then also growing our community character. And that's um, 
you know, what we have today, maintaining the small town feel, we're, you know, we're almost 90,000 people, but we still feel like a small town, maintaining that. But then as we become, you know, everyone what, talked about becoming or maintaining or having a, one of our priorities be being a diverse and inclusive city and being welcoming. And as we bring in more individuals, um, you know, maintaining our small town feel as we continue to grow. Um, we also um, talked about making sure that we are still welcoming. So as our city grows, uh, you know, not feeling like we're shutting the door behind them. Um, leaning, you know, one of the things that we talked about right there at the top was leaning in what we do well and working on the things that we don't. Um, and so things that we do well is our community, we have, a, you know, 90,000 people, but it still feels like everybody knows each other or they went to high school with each other to some degree or their parents worked with each other. Um, working on, the, um, you know, being together, um, but then also, um, so I'm going to read through these a little bit. Um, working on being a sustainable city was also when we talked about was a theme throughout. Um, and being sustainable isn't just like, hey, like turn your water off at night. It's like being self-sufficient or when we build housing, like making sure the housing itself is sustainable. So make, changing the kind of practices we have around, um, you know, maybe advocating for solar install on all new construction or, you know, water reclamation projects be put in there. So we're not, cause you know, we're in another drought um, and being sustainable in that way. But then also we talked about sustainability in terms of as the city grows, making, making sure that we can move around the town. Um, easy, not relying on cars. So looking at public transportation options, making things easier for bikes, make, making it more bike friendly. Uh, we mentioned 4th Street and East Avenue being not really safe streets to cut across because they're almost like highways through town. Um, and making sustainability in terms of like maybe having like micro buses in certain areas of town. So people who have mobility issues don't have to rely on wheels, which is great to travel across the entire town, but maybe they just want to travel with a shorter distance in this one specific area that wheels doesn't quite service. Um, we also, everyone mentioned housing and it's going to be extremely important um, that our housing element as we go forward um, is a diverse housing element, not just in terms of um, what is being built, like single family apartments or townhomes, but like it's the who of the housing. So low income, middle income and high income, making sure that we are um, building housing for all groups um, so that no one group is either pushed out um, completely, um, which is typically those who just can't quite afford to live in a certain area will get priced out by those who have the money to push, to push them out. Um, but then to also like um, in terms of age demographics or uh, race demographics, like making sure that we are, you know, it's almost, it's illegal in some cases to do some of these, but um, we want to make sure that we are, uh, not creating uh, communities where like, you know, if you're an older individual, this is where you live. And if you're younger, you live over here, like creating, creating like diverse neighborhood communities. And so that people feel, you know, their positive experiences come from people of all uh, demographics. Mm -hmm. um, and then really quickly, I think when we talked about some of the issues that we had, I know we only have two minutes, um, issues that we wanted to maintain was, you know, housing, um, and homelessness, oh. um, making sure um, Livermore stays a safe community over the next 20 years, um, preserving the open space that we do have, and maybe expanding upon some of the open space um, opportunities, um, like in South Livermore down by um, the um, old Quarry Lakes, and converting those into park spaces. Um, sustainability, um, creating places that, you know, we it's, it says creating places um, for a diverse community for, to simply exist without feeling like they're going to like, oh, we're going downtown to go shopping. It's like, we're just going to this park to exist, right? And, and spend time with the, the community, like community spaces. Um, and then, you know, also, um, which was, you know, honoring our heritage as we do grow over the next 20 years, but then also making sure that we are inclusive of all everyone else that comes in and bringing their um, experiences and their, um, you know, their culture and heritage and then bring it into Livermore as well and not feeling like Livermore is only a cow town or only a lab town. As we grow and expand, Livermore has the, the opportunity to be known for a lot of things, not just what we were founded upon or anchored to. Right. And that's the two minute warning.
Excellent job, Asa. Thank you very much. I think that was a great um, summary. And for those of you in the other groups, my guess from what I overheard and listening in is that you probably um, heard some of the same things that your group talked about. So that's great. We love to see commonalities emerge and we also love to see original ideas pop up among the groups. So let's hear from group number two. Group number two is your spokesperson. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm oh, a you note taker. Share yours, Allison. You can. Um, uh, Tarina's got it here. Oh, perfect. Yeah, we just need your spokesperson. Is that Alan? Yeah. Great. So, Go ahead, Alan. So as Joanna uh, suggested, uh, we talked about a lot of the same things. There's, um, and I think the the point, the overarching is that we all like Livermore, and we want it to maintain a lot of its character. And so the question is how how to grow. Uh, and, and maintain that to, to be able to provide opportunities for all. all. We talked about trying to maintain um, job uh, employment balances so that people do not have to commute. Obviously, some people will commute. Uh, we, we talked also about the, the mandates for housing. Um, uh, uh, Trish said, talked about 4,500 uh, housing units that need to be built in the next seven years, for example, and how do those get in, integrated into the town in terms of consuming open space or being infill uh, a, uh, in terms of uh, mother-in-law units or, or, or uh, expanding there. And, and when we talked about the, the infill, we talked about um, making sure that the city is planned for all the appropriate infrastructure to accommodate uh, these kinds of developments, uh, sewer, electric, what, whatever it is. Uh, um, and, and water, we talked a little bit about concern about uh, the availability of water. And uh, another thing we talked about was uh, the connection to open space. We all like the urban boundary, uh, being surrounded by urban, uh, by, uh, by rural areas. And so what can we do um, to um, make sure that the parks around us remain viable. There was a discussion of whether or not Livermore should contribute to the purchase of the N3 Ranch, which is a proposed major uh, park watershed up above Del Val, uh, 50,000 acres. And uh, let me see, um, I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, we talked also about sustainability, and sustainability has many different um, aspects. One is environmental, another is financial. The city needs to be um, financially solvent in order to, <laughs> to maintain uh, uh, the, the services and the environment that we all like. Um, and, and finally, I, 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 we, we talked a little bit about um, the difficulty of predicting how technology will affect will affect us in the future. Yeah. If you go back 20 years, you know, how many people predicted um, how pervasive uh, Amazon would be? Um, you know, 20 years ago, we all wanted uh, coax cable for Comcast. Now, now it's, it's uh, Wi-Fi. And, and so there's all these things that, you know, when you're, when you're trying to plan, you need to make sure that your uh, zoning is flexible enough to be able to accommodate the changes in the way, um, society works that you don't necessarily predict uh, very accurately uh, uh, from from our current perspective. Um, I, I, I might, if you ask people, uh, you know, about predicting the future, they usually have linear predictions. And, and uh, you know, you ask a person in 1910 uh, about the future, they didn't know about computers, cell phones, all that sort of stuff. So that gives yeah. you an idea of, of, of the kinds of things you need to be able to uh, plan to accommodate the unknown unknowns. Very good, Alan. All right, thank you so much, um, Alan, and thank you to group two. Let's, uh, let's hear from group three. Give us your two minute uh, summary of some of the high points. Who are we gonna hear from? Hey, Joanna, it's Andy. That would be Deborah from group three. All right, Deborah. You need any help getting unmuted? Where are you, Deborah? Here she is. 
Uh, Sorry about that. I was unmuted. I don't know. I, I went over to uh, get the um, list in another program, and I wonder if that caused me to be bounced out. That's so, right. um, take it away. Um, so our group, of course, is talking about um, maintaining the open space. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis is uh, on maintaining uh, the community character. The open space, um, people want open space within the city, within the downtown corridor area, and also around the periphery of Livermore. They want to preserve the ranching life and um, those nice country elements, and they don't want to lose those. They want it to be an inclusive area that um, is inviting to all uh, people of uh, uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds. There's um, some mention about solar farms infringing on open space and the concern about that. Um, there's an interest in preserving um, water capture, wasted water capture, and trying to have a better system for that to improve and look at water values as we move forward in Livermore. Um, um, improving communication and having communication reaching citizens in a timely manner so that policy changes are transparent and they receive those in, <clears throat> in a timely manner. There's a lot of discussion about transportation and integrating um, reduced car usage and bringing in um, other options for transportation throughout town, which includes a city program for bikes, um, some alternatives for city um, contracted um, cab use was one of the um, discussions that was brought up and had uh, a lot of discussion. Um, people did discuss parking to a degree. And um, as Mayor Marchand brought up, 85% of the citizens of Livermore in the last outreach plan uh, made parking uh, one of their number one priorities and having enough parking. Um, there was made uh, mention of, again, in inclusionary and integrated housing projects, meaning housing throughout the city so that uh, large buildings aren't built and they are segregated socioeconomically into low income and that uh, we have an integrated process of diversity throughout the city, both socioeconomically and um, culturally. Um, there was mention about um, increased usages of ADUs and ADVs and some mention of the new uh, SB 9 and 10 um, legislation and how that could be used in a positive way, provided that infrastructure is applied as mentioned in meeting number two, uh, to make sure that the proper amount of uh, support is there for that kind of infill. And um, other key issues, um, again, uh, planning ahead, conserving space and land and water resources is a high priority. Um, um, building strengths, building, building priorities around Livermore strengths. And some of those strengths included partially their diversity already, their established diversity, their history, their open space, uh, their protection of environment, um, preserving longstanding ranching environment, the wineries, um, and using some new technology uh, coming out to help us do those things, achieve those things. Also preserving downtown businesses and making sure that businesses are vital and small businesses have opportunities in Livermore. Uh, growing within our resource capabilities so that it's sustainable. Um, and being having an eye uh, moving ahead towards growth. When Valley Link comes in, the population could increase to 105,000 and we need to be prepared for that and have housing available for that many people. And that pretty much sums it up. Fantastic, Deborah. You really Thanks, um, Deborah. covered a lot. Uh, I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you in group three. Thank you. It sounds like a really productive um, discussion. Again, I think we can see some common themes emerging, but also some, some new ideas. Um, all right, group four. Who are we going to hear from? I, I got uh, to speak up last, so I got chosen. All right, please go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, the thing that we were all able to agree on is that we wanted to be alive in 2045, so we could see <laughs> all these changes. Although we had one dissenting member on that. Uh, uh, the value of using these breakout sessions is obvious in that uh, 
many themes come up. And so I'm not going to address those, but I'll try to focus on what's different about our particular group and Perfect. what we thought was important there. Okay. Uh, the common theme that we see is uh, change is inevitable and that we must be addressing that change and identifying what can be done and what cannot be done as far as change because we, we simply can't do everything. Uh, there was a very valuable input in our group uh, and we all recognize the value of uh, the agricultural surrounding uh, land use in the, in the uh, community and that that needs to be integrated with many of the uh, aspects of the uh, growth that we're seeing now and uh, we'll, in, we'll see in the future as well. That's one of our, uh, the biggest recurring themes that was addressed in our group. Uh, another important idea was the uh, idea of building consensus on all these different divisive issues between the different groups uh, and, and different viewpoints as well, individuals and groups that applies to. And we think that the uh, city council should uh, be assigned the uh, responsibility of building consensus rather than leaving it to individuals. Uh, as a, frankly, that's one of their duties we feel. Uh, the uh, people already mentioned some of the groups about diversity and divisiveness, but we chose to look at that from the housing viewpoint. And we think that the differing ethnicities in uh, Livermore do not have a, a common access to, to housing. And we need to address that in some fashion. So that's pretty much our conclusions. All right, excellent. Um, thank you so much for that. So our last um, but absolutely equally important group is group five. Uh, that would be me presenting from group five. That's Tracy. Take it away, uh, here's what I'm going to say, and that is many of the issues that have already been articulated obviously also came up for our group as well. Um, what I think was really amazing, I'll summarize at a high level and dig into stuff that we also covered and then some of the uniqueness of our discussion, which is we kind of had this consensus that there is a broad recognition of the breadth and width of our community. And that was even represented in our group itself. So when it came to defining the things that we liked, what we realized very quickly was that there was a need to make sure that we were even all talking from the same page when it came to saying things like, are we safe? My safe is different than your safe. So can we be curious about these differences and make sure they get articulated as part of the values of the plan? My small town is different than your small town. And, and all of the things that drive the discussions on inclusion and equity and access are facets of how those lenses get represented into these terms. So the more curious we are about representing them, the better we're going to be about creating that sort of resonance of now into the future. Um, and I think that's really where we see the opportunity. We see the opportunity for commerce, transit, sustainability, of course, fiscal responsibility, and this very broad term of character of the city, arts, closure, arts and culture, inclusion and open space. So when we got to the vision for Livermore in 2045, we have this list that is huge because all of us represented a very wide gamut of experiences. Everything from I'll be dead by then to I don't know if I'm gonna be able to walk by then to what's the environment gonna look like. So, you know, we realize that the framework in which the decisions are made are equally as important as the decisions themselves. We want a clean city, a transit friendly city, a walkable city, an open city, a welcoming city. And therefore the basis of that is our discourse and our valuing of the science and the measure of these things underneath of them. Um, and so also that also meant too that like some of these terms like open space, downtown, how big, where, where should it be put if it can't be put downtown? 
Um, and some of the terms like, you know, when we think about transit and cars, you know, it really did come up that we can do a better job helping people get around town to create that small town that we want to feel as well. Um, going to the next sort of set of questions and ideas that we had, you know, there is, um, there are underpinnings of transparency, of timelines being important and moving too quick is something that really can alienate people. That participation and inclusion and welcoming need to underpin it as does fiscal prudence as does you know, the notion that you know, this is the one opportunity for participatory democracy to be expressed as broad and wide as possible across the city. So we need to make sure to account for that as we're going through this process. And then lastly, I think you know, on question four, what are the key issues? We've heard a lot of them already. And it serves to reiterate that you know, we are bound by our concerns of the future. We are all concerned about traffic and cars. We are all concerned about the housing crisis. We are all concerned about the environment. We are all concerned about how sustainable our lives are. Um, some of the, the more interesting things that we put on that list are things like elderly space, like physical and mental health, like ensuring social services are accessible, like ensuring that equity is an underpinning, like ensuring that you know, that transportation is both inside Livermore as well as inside to outside Livermore. Uh, and I think last, I think that was the last question. We only did four or was there one more? I can't remember. Oh, that, no, that was it. it. Um, if there's anything from my group that I missed or misrepresented, folks, please, please, please chime in. Thank you, um, Tracy. And thank you, group five. That was great. Um, and uh, Tracy kind of stole my thunder a little bit because I was going to point out um, some of the um, commonalities, but they took care of that for me. So thanks again, Tracy. And, um, you know, I just, I will comment that uh, I, I, I think one, one thing that's very cool that I really appreciate about Livermore and that is unique from other, many of the other communities that I work with is that there's such a strong sense in Livermore of both um, a, at a connection to and appreciation of a past for many people, um, but also an openness, whether that's to newcomers or new ideas or to innovation um, or to changing and adapting. So uh, I look forward to working with all of you on a general plan that kind of balances both of those really core pieces of, of what I see as um, you know, Livermore's unique identity. Um, and I know that we're uh, a little bit over time. It's 8.45 now and we were shooting to end by 8.30. So thank you to those of you who are hanging in there with us. Uh, there's two more important pieces that we wanna talk about. They're both pretty quick. One is just to let you know about the next steps in this process. I've mentioned both of these already, but um, as a reminder, we have online activities on the website. Uh, every slide in this PowerPoint has the web address, imaginelivermore2045.org. You can go there and spend more time with the same exercise that we did tonight, or you can send your friends there to give their input. We'd love to hear from you or them. That's gonna be live through October 3rd. We're gonna be um, at the Civic Center Library on Saturday in person for some face-to-face -face outreach. Um, it's kind of similar to what you see in this picture here from when we were at the farmer's market a couple of weeks ago with posters and post-it notes and an opportunity for you to add your words. Um, that is Saturday from 12 to 3. And again, it's part of the um, Latinx and Hispanic Heritage Month celebration at the Civic Center Library. So look for us there. We'll be the ones with the bubble machine. And then in October, we're going to start up with um, the GPAC, the General Plan Advisory Committee. First, we have a meeting with them just to make sure that they're all set up and understand their role. And then we're gonna have another meeting later in October to review a draft vision statement that reflects the input we heard here tonight and that we collected from all of our other um, sources. So the dates for those aren't set yet. That committee is actually still in the process of being formed. So um, we still have some details to nail down about that, but um, keep an eye on the website, imaginelivermore2045.org for all of that information. And then very finally, um, you've all, uh, you've already shared so much with us tonight. And we're again, very, very grateful. 
Um, but I also want to ask if you're willing to spend just a couple more minutes giving us your feedback on tonight's workshop. Um, how did it go for you? What can we do better next time? We are, we do want this come process to be transparent and inclusive, and we want it to work well to capture a broad diversity of voices. So we are very interested in hearing from you on how we can do that uh, and do that better. So the link is in the chat to that survey, or again, you can take a picture with your phone. Uh, you don't have to fill that out right this second, but we again would really love to hear your feedback um, on this workshop tonight and your ideas um, for going forward. That's our um, last slide. I will just take the opportunity to say again, thank you so much. Your participation means uh, an enormous amount to us. We can't do this plan without you. So I hope that each one of you who's here tonight will remain involved. And I hope you'll all tell 10 of your friends and neighbors that this is happening and that we wanna hear from them. Andy or anyone else, any other closing words? I'd just like to thank everybody, but especially group three. We got sucked out of our breakout room so fast. Uh, we had a great discussion. I really appreciate it. All right, excellent. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.